Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this Judicial Conference on Jury Selection. I am delighted that all of the members of the Supreme Court are here, along with the Attorney General, the Public Defender, representatives of all three branches of government, leaders and representatives of a large number of organizations and groups in government, in the legal community, in our state civic affairs, judges of the appellate division, the trial court, and other members of the bar and the public who are participating remotely, thank you all for making time out of your schedules to participate. Our purpose in gathering today and Friday <clears throat> is easy to state, but a little bit harder to achieve, perhaps. It is simply to improve the jury selection process in our state. We all agree on how important that process is because a trial by jury is critical, not only to the criminal justice system, but to our society as a whole. Defendants have the right to be tried before a fair and impartial jury, the right to a jury that is drawn from a fair cross-section of the community. And citizens as well have the right not to be excluded on account of race, national origin, gender, religion, or other factors. Where there may be a difference of opinion is how best to achieve progress in upholding those principles. And that's especially true because many people who've worked in the system for years have long held views, including a view that some things must not change. In Isabel Wilkerson's book, Cast, she talks about what it's like to live in an old house where we've grown comfortable. The house may look beautiful on the outside, but we know that some problems have developed over time. So we find ways to deal with them that are far from ideal, like putting a bucket under that leaky part of the ceiling, or stepping over a floorboard that creaks, or perhaps looking away from that stress crack rather than investigating it and trying to repair it. And even if we choose not to look deeper, we know that's risky. As Ms. Wilkerson wrote, who wants to go into a basement after a heavy rainstorm and see what the rain has brought? But if we don't go, if we fail to do so and ignore the problem, it will only fester and get worse. She makes a persuasive case that there are real consequences to inaction. There are real consequences when we are not open to the possibility of change. So we gather today and Friday to consider ways to improve the jury selection process in New Jersey and in particular, to take steps to further root out discrimination from that process. Our state has been at the forefront of efforts in some ways, but not in others. On the one hand, we pay jurors $5 a day, which imposes a real hardship and has an effect on the pool of individuals who are available to serve. We also don't allow defendants who've been convicted of indictable offenses to serve on juries, and there is no time limit to that bar. On the other hand, the court issued opinion, an opinion a number of months ago, expanding state law to ad address not just purposeful discrimination in the way we select juries through the use of peremptory challenges, but also to address implicit bias. Yet at the same time, our system relies on a state statute that dates back to the 1800s and allows for more than double the number of peremptory challenges than elsewhere in the nation, a practice that has come under intense criticism for fostering discrimination and is also strongly supported by many practicing attorneys who argue that it helps them select fair jurors. These are not academic questions that should be left to scholars alone to consider. Just this past week, the entire nation read about jury selection in the context of the trial of the men accused of killing Ahmad Arbery. The process was covered extensively by the national and local media. We know that after 13 days of questioning of hundreds of jurors, the panel was narrowed to a group of 12 black people and 36 white people. And then in the end, a jury comprised of 11 white people and only one black person was seated. They will determine the guilt of three white men accused 
of fatally shooting a 25-year-old black male, Ahmad Arbery, in South Georgia last February. The trial court's words about the jury selection process were surely alarming to most readers. The judge acknowledged, quote, there appears to be intentional discrimination in the panel, end quote. Yet he found that defense counsel had provided non-discriminatory reasons for striking eight potential black jurors, and he rejected challenges to the selection process in the case. Now, none of us were in that courtroom. And without examining a complete record, we can't fully assess the judge's decision or the motives of counsel. But what happened highlights the importance of us stepping back and recognizing that jury selection affects not only defendants and prospective jurors, but it can also shake our faith in a system of justice and the faith of our neighbors in our state in the system of justice here in New Jersey. And that is something we cannot allow to fester. So I ask all of us to approach the questions that will be posed at this conference including the hard ones, with an open mind. And that applies to judges, practitioners, and members of the public alike. For two days, let's listen and learn together. Let's look carefully at those creaky floorboards instead of stepping around them. And as we tell jurors, let's not hesitate to re-examine views that we hold. Let's not hesitate to consider new, and different approaches. During the conference, we'll hear from panelists and speakers on a number of topics, academics who've studied the jury selection process, community leaders who've seen its impact on our justice system and the larger community, judges and leading lawyers who are familiar with the current practices and needs, no fewer than 17 leaders from a broad array of organizations who will share their insights, and three chief justices who will speak about reform efforts in their states. To the extent that time allows, we'll pose questions from people in the room here and those online, and we'll try to put hard questions to the speakers so that we can challenge them, engage them, and learn from them together. And after two days of presentations, a conference committee will continue to meet. It will be comprised of more than 30 individuals who represent a broad array of groups and views. The committee will pre prepare a report for the Supreme Court, the legislature, and the governor, and it can include a broad range of findings and a series of recommendations on topics like juror pay and the permanent disqualification of people who've been convicted of an indictable offense, expanding the types of sources from which we draw potential jurors, developing guidance for a new court rule on implicit bias addressing the collection of data about prospective jurors and sharing that information publicly. Changes to the voir dire process, including the subject of peremptory challenges and educating jurors and training attorneys and judges about implicit bias among other subjects. We'll draw on materials that are presented at the conference as well as from other sources. The judiciary has created a website that has a number of articles and postings on it already, including a general guide and materials from a number of groups. Last Friday, for example, the State Bar and the ACLU presented thoughtful papers that have been placed on the website. And I would encourage you, if you haven't already had the chance to do so, to take a look at it, spend some time reviewing those materials. After the conference, the plan is to circulate a report publicly within a matter of months. Even more important, our goal is that, that that report not sit on a shelf and collect dust, but it, that it form the basis for thoughtful and collaborative action by the judiciary, the legislature, and the governor to improve our system of justice. A great deal of work lies ahead to be sure, but I hope you don't think it's premature to say thank you to a few individuals who've worked tirelessly to help prepare for today's conference. In particular, Jessica Lewis Kelly, Caroline Hatton, Stephen Bonville, and Judge Glenn Grant, the director of the AOC. Also wanna thank the State Bar 
for agreeing to house this conference and for offering the Law Center to all of us for these two days. And thanks to our superb IT staff for enabling so many people to participate remotely as well. Thank you all for your efforts in preparing for this important conversation.